Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. And welcome to another edition of Hawaii in Uniform. I'm your host, Calvin Griffin. And uh, for those of you who may not have seen the program before, here in the program we talk about a lot of things that uh, deal with the veterans and military community. I have two very special guests today, but before I get into the introductions, uh, I'd like to remind you of the uh, fact that we have the Oahu Veterans Center located down in Foster Village, and there's a lot of good activities that go on down there that uh, affect the uh, active duty and also our, our veterans. A lot of good programs coming up. Uh, if you get a chance, you might want to call Claire Levinson, and you can reach her at 422-4000, and that's 422-4000 and they're located down in Foster Village. Uh, you might want to check it out. Uh, a lot of very important programs going on uh, that may be of interest to you. At this point, what I'd like to do is introduce two special guests to the program. One is Mr. Paul Alibas, who is a retired um, Army uh, Special Forces, and Mr. Bob Kent. Um, afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. Ms. Alivas, thank you for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. Good. Um, I know that um, you have a very extensive history. Uh, in fact, you've been here in Hawaii for a while, haven't you? Yes, I came okay. here in 1968. 1968. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Um, we're blessed in a way to have a lot of uh, veterans over here, like roughly about 120,000, mm -hmm. and a lot of them have come from some very extensive backgrounds. But your background is, um, like I say, you're in a rare air as far as some of the things you've done in your in your in your past. Mm -hmm. Could you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself when you went into the military and some of the um, locations that you were involved with? I was born the 22nd of August, 1918, in Sapio, New Mexico, mm -hmm. way out in the boonies. My father was a cowboy. We were on a cattle ranch. Very few trees. A lot of rattlesnakes and quarry dogs. But it was a very, very poor country. There was hardly no, uh, no stores around. Our closest store was 15 miles, uh -huh. and we had uh, horses and buggies, and we didn't have an automobile then. Uh -huh. yeah. military. Just Mil military history. Yeah. Okay. My military history. Yeah. Right. But just a point of interest also, you will be turning 100 this month. Yes. Okay. Giving people a reference point when you're talking about horses and buggies, you know, they may think of coal or ranch or something, you know, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry, please continue. Okay. okay. So, 26th September 1940, I joined the Army and uh, I assigned to the 100, I was assigned to 45th Division at Fort Collins, Colorado. Uh -huh. And then from there, we went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I got our basic training, and I was 157th Infantry for a long time. So it was a National Guard unit, of course, and they were all cousins and brothers and so forth. So I'm a stranger, so I was getting the long end of the stick. So I decided to go regular army, and uh, I went and was assigned to jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. Went through jump school. It was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division for World War II. I was at 101st Airborne Division through the war, and we finally, at the end of the war, it ended on us in Austria. In your career, you have uh, been associated or served with uh, a lot of members who nowadays we only read about in history books. Could you relate some of the people that you knew early in their career? I know that was uh, General uh, Westmoreland was one of them. Uh, my good buddy, Harry C. Agnew, and I, we, we met at Fort Benning, Georgia, going through jump school. He and I went through Thick and Thunder. We took all the training, and we went all through the war, and uh, we wound up together you know, after many, many years. And uh, he and I were real tight. Um, I know that you, as far as you, the uh, conflict in Europe, you were part of the Battle of the Bulge or participated in that as far as? Yeah, I was with the unit that jumped in Normandy, Holland, and Bastogne, mm -hmm. World War II, 101st Airborne Division. And uh, we did uh, Normandy, Holland, and uh, Bastogne. Yeah. Okay. And he also jumped behind the lines in Normandy mm -hmm. and Bastogne. Yeah. Okay. 
No, also, in Medellin. Uh, no, Bastogne, we, we, yeah, Bastogne, yeah. Bastogne, yeah, okay. Uh, Bob, I actually want to introduce you to the program also. Uh, we're gonna continue, sir. Uh, uh, how did you two meet? Uh, or you have a long-standing relationship, or is this part of the organization's? Well, event? he was a deacon in the First Baptist Church of Milan, mm -hmm. and I'm a deacon in the First Baptist Church of Bonneville. Right. So that's how we met uh -huh. uh, through our church work. Great, great. Because uh, Bob, you were in Vietnam, right? Or... Yes, I'm uh, retired. Uh, oh. with, with the Vietnam, the 25th Division. Yeah. Okay. And sir, you were in Vietnam also? Yes. Okay. What, what, you, what about your experiences there? How? Um, yeah. What was it like, you know, for Well, you say I did World War II Korea and Vietnam. Vietnam was the worst one because, see, World War II, we had a battleground. We had people in uniform. We yeah. knew who the enemy was. Korea, they were in uniform most of the time. Vietnam, they were all in civilian clothes most of the time. Yeah. We didn't know who was who. And we we're not supposed to kill the civilians. Yeah. But the civilians were killing us. They were the ones who were the bad guys. In, in Vietnam. Bob, it was your experiences, I know that um, it's one thing I want to point out. A lot of people, uh, the veterans you talk to, when you talk about, they're reluctant to talk about their combat experiences, you know, because uh, a lot of them, of course, will say that the true heroes were, you know, no longer with us anyhow, you know. But um, your tie in with Vietnam and your experiences also, is, was it similar or? Well, I was in the combat area with the 25th Division. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was one of those situations where people are shooting at you and you shoot back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not here, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah. Some of them are not, not there anymore because we had to kill them. Yeah, I think and, in hindsight nowadays, uh, some of the younger generation are, could be a little bit judgmental, you know, as far as, but they weren't there, they didn't know the circumstances. And what we try to remind people also is, there's a difference between the policies, you know, and being serving in the military. You know, and there's a time when, even if you don't agree with it, but uh, there's a time and place before, you know, you address it. When we served in the military, we have to follow our orders. Right. But what people tell us to do, what our seniors tell us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, when we come back from Vietnam, it wasn't like World War II or Korea. We had people standing out there calling us baby killers and holding signs up. Uh, against the war, mm -hmm. that was protesting against us. We couldn't even wear our uniform. Oh. And that, that was a sad time. You can imagine, yeah. It was um, a very degrading situation when we yeah. came back. Yeah. Nobody liked us. Yeah, trying Thanks. to serve the country and people don't appreciate what's going on. Nothing. Um, there's one common theme also, I mean, we have a lot of our troops, a male and female, of course, that are serving in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, of course, a lot of them come back with many different psychological issues, which is common with uh, anyone who's going to been in the combat environment for an extended period of time. One of the things we always talk about, and it's been mentioned a lot, is PTSD. Yes. Uh, back in World War II, I think they called it shell shock, or there was different, a lot of different terminologies that were used for it anyhow. Uh, but what, what about your experience, I mean, with all that you've been through, and I want to go touch a little bit more about your, your background and history with the military. But with everything that you've been through that we talked about offline, how were you able to cope getting back into the so-called society and deal with some of the things that you had dealt with in the past and put it into context with you know, your present situation? First thing you gotta remember, mm -hmm. you do things that you're told to do, survival. And after you come home, you gotta get busy doing something to get your mind off of it. Mm -hmm. I elect you to be restored Mustangs, the old Mustang. And that's quite a technical job, especially the instruments. You have to remember where this goes, that goes, and so forth, where you put it, where it's at, and so forth. So if you get involved in something that takes away the bad and brings in the good, that kind of relieves the mind and practice it more and more. So just getting refocused. Because yes. I know that nowadays there's a lot of programs out there and you know that try to help the service members mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. But um, Bob, what, I mean, part of what you do also, because I know that you're heavily involved in the veterans community, you're a mentor with Judge Kubo's uh, office also. Um, but what the people you deal with, how do you try to, do you have the same philosophy that... Um, the, yes, you have to have a 
something to keep your mind busy. Mm -hmm. And what I did when I retired, I got a job driving a city bus. Mm -hmm. And driving a city bus mm -hmm. definitely keeps your mind busy. <laughs> I mean, because yeah. you got to watch everybody on the bus, you got to keep them safe, right. and you got to do what you're told to do. Mm -hmm. And I did that for 22 years. Then I drove tour buses for another 12 years. Mm. And I'm 82 years old, and I'm still busy. I drive Uber right now. Oh. And I also uh, go to Veterans Treatment Corps, and I help the veterans get their VA benefits. Yeah. I've been a service officer before. Right. Well, sir, um, getting back to, uh, I don't want to mess up the opportunity to talk to you about a few <laughs> things anyhow, but as far as, um, like I say, the past history, uh, serving in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, who are some of the people, like say, that uh, some of the younger audiences may be familiar with that you served with, or is there any uh, circumstances that um, you went through that uh, is not really well known to um, the younger generations? Well, you see, when you're in the Army, you have to obey orders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you're soon going to learn how to do it. Right. So the thing to do is do what the sergeant tells you to do, no talk back, and volunteer for things that say, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. Volunteering gets you a little bit step higher towards promotions. Mm -hmm. What you do is you, want to, you don't want to be a private all your life, so you've got to work for, to be a non-commissioned officer by doing right things and helping those that need help. Pick them up, lift them up a little bit, encourage them, and say, okay, one more mile, one more mile, we're there. Well, I, I want to explain something. When he was in the Army, he was in the 101st Airborne Division. He was one of the first ones that was picked to serve in the Special Forces. Mm -hmm. He went through, was the first school that they had. Mm -hmm. He went through the Special Forces school. Sir, how did you get picked for that? Or did you, how did, did you volunteer for that? Or was, um, no. In the Army? Yes, sir. You are the Army? Uh, no, for the uh, Special yes. Forces. Special Forces, okay. Mm -hmm. We went out to make a jump one time, and there was uh, three people that came down from Washington to just start out the SEF. They called it Cywar in those days. With them was a battalion. He was in the OSS during World War II, after mm -hmm. Seizure Service. And he was kind of a, a guerrilla kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we went to make a jump. And uh, we were talking about promotion for it. He said, Paul, we're opening up a new unit, Cywar, and under it would be Special Forces, uh -huh. the Green Berets. And he said, it's a brand new one. He said, there'll be a lot of promotions, a lot of good jobs. And he said, your job qualified. Yes. I got my wings already. And he said, you speak Spanish fluently. I said, yes, I'm Spanish. He said, we want you. Uh -huh. So. In June, we started uh, putting our foot lockers together and wall lockers together, Smoke Bomb Hill, and in June, and in 52, we graduated. Right. Okay. One thing I uh, do want to bring up, um, you made a jump behind the enemy lines before. Could you tell a little bit about that? Well, also? with the 101st Airborne, I was with the unit that jumped behind the enemy lines in Normandy and Holland. We were in England first, training and training and training and training. And then the pool is in the marshalling area, we call it marshalling area, barbed wire. You can't go out and you couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. Briefing and briefing and briefing, what we're supposed to do, showing the signs and this and what to do and what not to do. We got ready for it. So finally the time came and for us to go. And uh, we finally got boarded our aeroplanes, C-19, C-47s, C-46s. There were a hundred and something planes in the air, 82nd Airborne Division, 101st, 17th Airborne, and several others jumped with us right. in our minute. So it was quite a big bunch of people coming in here. And it was nighttime. And we were getting shot at. Oh. We had a lot of the lights coming up at us and so forth, but that was it. Was that? You made it. Okay. Sir, I think, uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll come back. We'll continue mm -hmm. our conversation. And Bob, of course, want to get your intake on uh, you know a lot of the other different issues also. But um, stay tuned. Uh, Hawaii Uniform, and we'll be back shortly. Hello, Hawaii. 各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています
日本語コミュニティハワイの日本語コミュニティに便利なお助け情報ニュースなどをゲストをお招きしてお届けする番組ですこんにちはハワイ各週の月曜日2時からぜひ皆さん見てくださいホストの国瀬ゆかりでしたアロハ Hello, my name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of ThinkTech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pomai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. Okay, back with the Hawaiian uniform. Again, I'm your host, Calvin Griffin, and my two special guests today are Mr. Paul Alivas and also Mr. Robert Kent. And, uh, sir, you were just talking about um, the when you were going into Europe and mm -hmm. being on the planes. And yeah, yeah. We, we left out of uh, in the evening. The jump was made at nighttime, of course. We were scattered all over the place and finally landed and we tried to get ourselves together. Finally, we got organized and was able to uh, yeah. do our mission. Right. We lost a lot of people coming down, and we also lost of our, our gliders that were coming in, mm -hmm. and we needed them because there were heavy equipment with them, but they crashed in. Right. None of them didn't make it. A lot of the people that you serve with, I guess, of course, most of them are departed, mm -hmm. no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Are there any that are still um, do you keep in contact or maybe still be alive or you're the last of a dying breed? Oh, excuse me, that was wrong terminology. I wish I knew of somebody so yeah. that I could write them and talk to them. No, I don't know of anybody that was during my time. Yeah. They're all gone. The last one is Carl W. Griffin. Mm -hmm. He was uh, my sergeant major for a long time mm -hmm. and uh, he's passed away. So at my age, uh, I think they're all gone. Yeah. Well, you've done a lot of phenomenal things in your military career and of course how when you got out of service continuing to do what you do. And I know that there are people in the community who are gonna help to commemorate your hundredth birthday. Um, Bob, could you tell us a little bit what's going on and uh, what activities yeah. are planned? On the twenty second, uh, Paul will be one hundred years old. And on the twenty fifth, we're having a celebration birthday party for him at Lane Hula Golf Course. Mm -hmm. It's going to be from 6 o'clock to about 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. And then on the 26th, which is a Sunday afternoon, uh, around 3 o'clock, uh, about five of us are going to go jump, uh, parachute, uh, skydive. And he's going to go skydiving. <laughs> okay. Hey. They asked me, what do you want for your birthday? Mm -hmm. I said, another jump. Yeah. That's my birthday present. So I said, yeah. So uh, I'm preparing for it. Mm -hmm. How many, for it. how many jumps, roughly, have you made over your lifetime? Oh, way over 100. Way over 100. I'm a master jumper. Yeah, master jumper. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Way over 100. All right. What is, what is something that you would like to share to someone with our <coughs> younger service members mm -hmm. and also um, uh, the young people in the community? What, what did you take away from your military career that can be translated into something that um, is of use to most of us out here? The Army makes you what you are. Mm. You give it, it gives you back twice as much. In the Army, you're not going to get rich, but you're going to make a good living. And if you want to, you can learn a lot of trades, especially if you go in the National Guard. Mm. I would say the young ones finish high school, go in the National Guard. You get discipline, number one. Yeah. You've got to have discipline. Even the children, when they're growing up, this is the trouble nowadays, there's not too much discipline. Discipline is the main thing that you teach your children. Mm -hmm. Discipline. Understand. Do this, do that, and obey them. Yeah. So I would teach them discipline. And I tell the young ones, especially for any high school, go to the National Guard, get you a nice job doing there, and apply for school when you get out, and, and, and uh, you take, take a course and something that you can do, and then you got a job when you get out. Mm -hmm. you do, a lot of the uh, people, they don't take advantage of uh, the National Guard. And when they get out, there's a lot of schools that you can go to. So it's, it's, good. it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Bob, you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. I've talked to Middle Atlanta High School, and uh, I expressed to them that uh, 
to be able to get respect from somebody, you have to show respect to right. them. And this way, with the discipline and the respect, that is one, two of the most important things in the military that you can do. Is to, I, I, I always say, to have a friend, you have to be a friend. Uh, Treat everybody equally. Yeah, it seemed like a lot of the old tried and true philosophies that were standard, you know, practices um, years ago. With the way society is changing, you know, people get confused about a lot of things, but there's certain truisms that still remain today, you know, yeah. that um, doesn't change. I mean, there's certain things, attitudes change, but um, <clears throat> as far as with uh, making through life, there's certain basics that now, you need. There's a saying, what goes around comes around. Right. So what we've done in the past, it's coming back a little bit at a time. Yeah. Showing you that. And uh, you always see, remember that. You see, we're all brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Christ is our Father. If you believe. And you should treat everybody equally, as you say, huh? Right. No, there's no difference. It's who you are and what you do, not what you are. Can you give it all you got, yeah? There's no decision. And if you see a poor fallen veteran, try to give him a hand. Yeah. Say hello to him at least. Yeah. Uh -huh. Respect him because he's been there. You've been there. You know what it is. He's there. He didn't have very good luck. He didn't, didn't do the thing right. Maybe he's down there sleeping on the street, on the sidewalk. I feel sorry for him. Yeah. I feel sorry. Yeah. There's a lot of them out there that uh, lost. Definitely all in this thing together. You know? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so we, I know we don't. We're getting down to the wire. We just still got a little bit more time left anyhow. But um, like I said, there's so many things I want to get into. But I'm quite sure that over the years, you've had people who have interviewed you. Is there anything, a source that uh, anyone who wants to know your background can you know, reference? Or do they have to wait? You know, people that have interviewed me, you say? Mm -hmm. Is there any uh, books that have been published or articles that uh, if someone wanted to go back and review your history? Well. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he lives in Milani. He's my deacon and I'm his deacon, Roy Ogasawara. He's a Green Beret. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk a lot about the past and what we should be doing nowadays. He did an article on me and the, what is it, a weekly or something, mm -hmm. a newspaper. Mm -hmm. I came out on that. And they showed me where I was with my Mustang, that I restore Mustang, and part of my army life and my career. So I'm thankful for friends. If you don't have friends, I'd rather have friends than money. Right. Yeah. I'd rather have friends. Money can expand and you don't have any but friends or stick with you forever. If you need help, they're there for you. That's a friend. Um, Bob, anything you want to add to that, or? Uh, well, I, I've known Paul, and I've known a lot of the veterans. I helped the veterans out, and it doesn't make any difference. The main thing is, what's on the outside doesn't count. It's what's on the inside that counts. Amen. I mean, the color of the person, the kind of food they eat, the language they speak, doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. We all have red blood. And we're all blood brothers, all right. regardless of what is on the outside. Yeah. And just the attitude of some of the young people today is disturbing to the older people because they don't have the respect that they should have. Yeah. Because a lot of them have been brought up with a single family, their mother, mm -hmm. and the mother has worked three, two, three jobs just to support them that they're not home to take care of them during the time that they're in school. I think what's hurting our younger generation is drugs. Drugs. Drugs and television. Uh, drugs. Lack of focus. Drugs. Yeah. Sir, uh, gentlemen, we're getting down to the wire. I think we have about a minute and a half left. Um, sir, is there anything else you'd like to share with us? We... Well, tell them about your time in Bristol and uh, how General Patton came in and yeah. saved you. Okay. Yeah. We, we, were, we went to Bastogne uh, right around Christmas time. We were completely surrounded. We weren't getting any ammunition. We were getting low of ammunition, medical supplies, and the weather was bad. They couldn't 
fly in and drop us anything, completely surrounded. I told Harry Siagna, I said, Harry, we've had it. We're running out of this and that and the other. And it was early one morning, and I heard some tanks roaring. He heard them too. He says, uh oh, here comes the tanks. We've had it now. I listened. I said, no, Harry, these are not German tanks. These are American tanks. He said, how do you know? I said, listen to the track. The German tank has more rubber in the tracks. What happened, Patton said, Abrams, Colonel Abrams, we need you in Bastogne. Get all your troops that you can, your tanks, and you open up the gap. And that's what liberated us. They got them safe. They came in and opened up the gap. On that high note, I think we got about 30 seconds left. Mm -hmm. But I want to thank you for sharing with that. And I hope to sometime in the future have you come back on the program. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, when I first approached you about this, you were reluctant about coming on the program, which I understand because with you, with Bob and a lot of the other veterans, they all say the same thing. It's not about me. It's about my you know, fellow battle buddies. Anyhow, but I want to publicly thank both of you, you know, for serving, doing what you can, being very outstanding individuals within the community. Uh, set an example. That's a great thing, anyhow, you know, for the younger people. But, sir, again, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you come on the program. And, uh, Bob, same thing. And, like I say, hope you come back. Well, and thank we'll you. God do this bless you. God bless us. Thank program. you for having me. You keep up the good work. We'll try. We need people like you. Thank you. And we need soldiers. We'll try. We're all soldiers in this way. Amen to that. Okay, on that, uh, I think it's time to wrap it up. But um, again, um, thank you for tuning in. And we're trying to bring you more information about these gentlemen and some of the other unsung heroes in our, in our community. But uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, God bless. And until that time. <laughs>